church. Hi. Welcome to all of you. Uh, welcome back to some of you for evening service. We're, uh, we're waiting for others to file in, and everybody's seated in the back for some reason. I feel like we need to, like, we need to block some of those back rows off and push you guys up front to the splash zone, as I call it. Um, yeah, good to, good to have you. Glad you've uh, uh, come back to worship with us this evening. Thank, thank you all for coming. I want um, to, uh, Natasha, if you crack, crack the whip back there if there's anybody. Uh, tell them we're starting. Uh, Psalm 85, verses 4 to 8. I want to read those verses for us to contemplate as we start. Psalm 85. Verses uh, 4 to 8. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and cause your indignation toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not yourself revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. And the psalmist positions him, himself to, to hear what God says. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But let them not turn back to folly. I'm not sure exactly why you're here uh, this evening. I, I have a pretty good bead on things, a, a feeling that we're going to be talking about Christian peace. And um, yeah, but you could be here for a whole bunch of reasons. You could be here just out of force of habit, which is not a bad thing. That's, that's actually, you can look at that in a real positive light. You regularly come to church. It, it might be uh, something else like just joyful obedience. If it's obedience, I hope it's joyful. You might be here... Um, you might be here just invited and, uh, and seeking after, you know, you still haven't found what you're looking for sort of a thing, which is, which is also good. Welcome if that's where you're at. Uh, or maybe you have lost your, your Christian peace for some reason. It's, it's easy to do. Um, peace in general is, let alone Christian peace, is, a, is, a, is an elusive thing these days, whether it's, you know, internal, um, your spirit, your, your walk with the Lord, whether there's something going on there, it might be, might be sin, it, you might be doubting him for some reason, uh, practical peace, you know, maybe, you know, we got, we got, uh, it's hard, but we, that we got families blowing up sometimes, we got church families blowing up sometimes, uh, and it, and there's also just that ever-present sort of thing where we got wars going on right now, which touch every one of us. Uh, politically, peace is difficult to come by. And, and, you know, the Lord promises us his peace. It's a peace that the world can't give. Um, I, my favorite um, hymn, I've told you before, my favorite Russian hymn is Chudnoya Ozera, Genisarietskaya. And it's got this one line where it goes, Ili lejit na nas plesen samnenia, ili tjesnit sujeta, ili at bur na vajizni valnenia, plokha nas vidna Hrista. This idea that there can be, that there can be, uh, we can be struggling with doubt, we can be struggling with just an the anxieties of life, or um, maybe life has thrown you a curveball, and you've, you've lost, you just, Again, you just feel like you've lost the peace that God normally provides. Whatever it is, you guys, um, that's, that's stealing uh, your joy and your peace, I just want to reread to you verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will say, for he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. And, and I, I trust that as a promise this evening. Will you stand with me and let's offer this time to the Lord. I know he's going to speak to his people peace this evening. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you just reliant 
expectant, um, overjoyed that we have been included in your family. We are your children, God. We, we were once children of wrath, and now, thanks to what Jesus has done for us on the cross and saving us and redeeming uh, for himself a people, we are children of God. We give you praise for that, and we know that that is the anchor of our peace, that we have peace with you now, God. Help us, I pray, Lord, to maintain that, to keep that, to show that uh, work in us this evening, your peace um, as we worship you, as we calm our hearts in prayer, Lord, and, and as we hear from your servants this evening, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. A couple songs, all right? Then Mark, sure up with the scripture reading.
Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, let's, yeah, let's remain standing. Um, tonight I'll be reading from Isaiah 57, 14, 21. Isaiah 57, 14, 21. Right. And it shall be said, build up, build up, prepare the way, remove every obstruction from my people's way. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would grow faint before me and the breath of life that I made. Because of the iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him, I hid my face and was angry, but he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace, to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Um, in this, I'll just pray. Thank you, God, that you see our hearts and see the hearts of those who are contrite and lowly in spirit and that you know who we are. Thank you that you are our peace and our comfort. Please comfort those who are sad and need your comfort, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are a God who acts and cares for his children. Amen. Just a, a few announcements, some body life that we need to talk about. It's a busy week for us this week. Um, I guess I'll just go like by day, a reminder for us. Uh, yeah, like a, your daily calendar. On, on Tuesday, uh, those men, you know who you are, who are a part of the Preacher's Round Table. Um, we are meeting. Uh, at 7 p.m. here in, in uh, this, this building. Yeah, so Preacher's Roundtable is on. Please come prepared uh, to learn and to just share with one another in talk shop. Um, Wednesday, just the usual Bible studies. It's always 7 p.m. at uh, my place with the young adults, and there's a uh, Bible study held in Russian on uh, in the hall, 7 p.m., it's going through the book of Hebrews, so remember that. Um, we had a, um, a brother pass this last week, um, didn't know him personally, um, Vladimir Avakumov, many, many of you know. Um, he passed last week, and we are going to hold his funeral this Thursday, so if you knew him, or if you would like to be a part of this uh, celebration of his life and support the family, it will be at 10.30 um, a.m. here. Uh, and there'll be about an hour, hour and 15 minute service, and then the burial at Cheltenham, and then we'll come back for a, uh, a meal in honor of the deceased, and yeah, just a time of, of remembrance there. So just remember that 10.30, and, Make that a hard start, 1030, because the, the family will be in uh, prior, just gathered together, um, grieving. And so at 1030, it'll, we'll start. Um, Saturday, Saturday evening, there's a, our annual meeting, the AGM meeting, 6 p.m. Brothers, r remind me what AGM stands for. Annual General Meeting. Okay, that's that. That's legit. That makes sense. I just wasn't. I wasn't exactly sure, but that's our, our annual meeting that we're going to have, and, and we'll be um, voting in uh, new committee members. So be thinking about be thinking about that. Um, chashka chai. Don't forget afterwards after service, a time of fellowship together, enjoy one another's company, and then um, I just wanted to. I'll just I'll just do it now. Jake, I just want to, I want to, um, yeah, talk about you. Thank you for, for being here and for uh, sharing whatever the Lord's put on your heart. Uh, Jake's been a kind of, I mean, I know a couple pastors in the area, but I don't, don't know him quite like Jake, who's been very helpful to me, been a friend. 
And yeah, brother, I look, I look forward to what God's going to say through you. Let's sing some more. Um, why don't we sit for the first? Okay. And is that okay? Sit so for the first, and then maybe we'll stand for the second. All right. Uh, let's do that. sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, he learned for good, he lived and died, to buy my father, and then he raised that to prove my Savior lived.
Uh, good evening, uh, church. It feels like a long time uh, since I have been here. It is a pleasure to come and preach to you this evening, peace. Peace, you may have picked up from the readings and the introduction uh, that we are talking uh, very much about peace tonight. Uh, about a month ago, I came across this statistic. It may not shock you, or it may. Uh, at the moment in the world, there are 32 wars unfolding. Uh, somewhere in the world, uh, there are, or across the world, uh, 32 wars are occurring today. And that's a shocking statistic, and, and many people here uh, have been very directly affected by that war, some of those wars. Uh, but also, there is a sense of war or lack of peace, which I am very confident in saying every single person in this room has been affected by. Those long nights of the soul, uh, the inability to rest, confronted by the th fact that you do not do the things you want to do or know you should do, uh, confronted by the reality, once again, you have done something you know you shouldn't have, uh, the sense of guilt and shame uh, isolates you uh, and it robs you of your peace. Now we know uh, in scripture that the world was created with perfect peace. Men and women had perfect peace with God. Men and women had perfect peace with one another. But as sin entered the world, peace exited the world. And we see this, yes, at the level of nations, but we see this at the level of communities as families fight each other as families fight within themselves and as individuals are torn apart by a guilty conscience. Have you ever asked why this is? Have you ever stopped to ask why in Psalm 85 God needed to promise that he would speak peace to his godly ones? And why it is in our verse today that the Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned by Paul, Ephesians 2.17, he proclaimed, he came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you, that is the church, who were far away in peace to those who were near, that's everybody. Why don't you have peace? Well, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. We had the passage read before about this. <clears throat> and we should slow down and learn and look closely at God's word because he tells us exactly why we don't have peace. I'll read it again, Isaiah 57, verses 20 to 21. But the wicked are like the storm-tossed sea, for it cannot be still. And as waters churn up mire and muck, there is no peace for the wicked, says my God. Has anyone, one of my favourite things to do is to go down if there's a storm. This frustrates my wife immensely. Uh, if there's a storm, I'll be found at the end of the semaphore jetty just watching the ocean churn up and crash around. I've got no interest in a flat, beautiful ocean. I love the drama of a churning sea. Why does it churn? What is being pointed to at here that reflects the state of the wicked? Well, we know that the sea churns because there are two diametrically opposed forces pulling at it. So the moon has a gravitational pull in the sky and it exerts a power to drag the ocean towards itself. Whatever side the moon is on of the globe, the ocean is trying to, trying to tilt itself towards that side where the moon is. It is pulling the ocean towards it. And yet at the same time, at the centre of the earth, there is a magnetic force that pulls the ocean in another direction. And what these two forces play out in the life of the ocean is it churns, it cannot rest, it is being tugged and pulled at by two powerful forces over which it has no control. So even when we look upon the ocean, and it may look calm, underneath the calm surface, great currents and, and rapids of water are crashing around beneath the surface. Much like people who have learned to look very calm, yet inside there are great conflicts at play. Why? Because we were created in the image bearers of God. And we long to do what is good and right. The power of God 
communicated through creation to you, through his word, through your nature as God's image bearer calls you towards a life of godliness. And yet Satan and sin equally exerts its power and its call upon us to live a different life, to follow different ways, two powerful and opposing forces that pull at the soul of men and women and produce the my and the muck, as I says, of sin. Is not your life like this at times? Listen to Paul describe the experience in Romans 7, 22 to 24. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law. But I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Is that not the experience of somebody being torn this way and that by the goodness of God and the evil of sin in their life? There's no satisfaction or peace in the pull of evil because you were designed by God for his goodness and his glory and yet you are unable to answer the call of that goodness in your life without God. This is what Isaiah is telling us. This is what the reality is for everybody you know who does not have Jesus Christ in their life. What a wretched man I am, says Paul. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will rescue me from the war in my soul? Is that not what the gospel is about? Well, our passage today tells us that Jesus Christ came, the Son of God, everlasting to everlasting, and he preached peace. He preached peace with God because he paid the debt of our evil, We have peace with God through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have peace with each other and within ourselves because he sent the Holy Spirit to live within you, a spirit not of fear but of power, love and sound judgment, 2 Timothy 1.7. So the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit that he and the Father sent you has overcome the pull of evil in your life and enabled you to walk in peace, to seek nourishment from his word, to find life and love in his church, increasingly resisting sin in your life. So the question this evening is, what does Paul mean that Jesus came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near? Well, we know that preaching the gospel was a central part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Immediately after overcoming Satan in Luke 4, we see that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. What was he teaching? Mark 1, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So Jesus Christ absolutely preached the gospel of peace as a primary motivation for his ministry. Make no mistake of the role of preaching for Jesus Christ in his ministry. God rules through his word, always has. He creates through his word. New life comes through the right preaching of the word of God delivered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Make no mistake about the role of preaching in the life of God's church and his rule in his creation. But Paul is writing to the Ephesians and they are not Jewish. And they have not heard Jesus preach. So while, yes, I think Paul is including Jesus' own preaching ministry here, 
Understand, you are now caught up in something bigger than you. Paul is expanding the work of Jesus in preaching peace to those who are near and those who are far to include the work of his church. Jesus continues to preach peace to the world through you. Through you. Let me explain. Acts 1.1, Luke writes, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do, do and teach. Notice that the Gospel of Luke, for Luke, is just the beginning of what Jesus began to do and teach. And the book of Acts is about how Jesus Christ is continuing to do and continuing to teach. And what is the book of Acts about? The birth of the church. Jesus Christ is continuing to preach peace to the world through the acts of his church, which means no less than preaching peace to the streets of Queenstown through you, the assembled people of God here. This church isn't brothers and sisters. This church is so much more about, what do you call it, Chariska Chai? Chariska Chai. I said something Brazilian, I think. But it is so much more than coffee and cake. Because you have been caught up in the very preaching ministry of Jesus Christ, who he is working through today for the glory of his Father and the joy of his people. And that is your calling. 2 Corinthians 5.20 Therefore we... I'm going to change it. Therefore... Slavic Church Queenstown are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through you. Therefore, plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Jesus came and he proclaimed the gospel of peace with God and peace with one another through the power of his life, death, death and resurrection. And now, today, the Lord Jesus Christ continues to proclaim peace between God and mankind mankind by faith in his work for us on the cross through his church through you and that is exactly what you are called to do to proclaim peace through Christ between those who should by any other logical explanation be at war Because we believe that there is power in the blood of Christ to save the worst of sinners like us. And that peace is possible for all people in Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago I was in Sydney. And I was working with uh, two Scottish friends and they just returned from a supermax prison in Texas. Uh, where they taught for a week. Now it turns out that in the middle of the very worst prison in Texas there is a reformed Bible college. A lot of people think that's where all reformed Bible colleges should be. But, but <clears throat> so these men, it was begun by a man who uh, had gone to Vietnam in the United States Air Force uh, and had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was returned to Texas and he was convinced that in the power of the Lord, he was, he was called to do prison ministry. Uh, and he opened up, after a long time of decades uh, advocating, he opened up a Bible college in the worst prison of Texas. And it is a radical, full-scaled Bible college. Uh, it is a five-year master's degree, and you cannot be eligible to enter into this Bible college if you are eligible for parole. They only want the worst of the worst of the worst. And so they brought these men in, out of their rage and hate and division, belonging to different gangs, and they started to teach to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And bit by bit, peace has descended upon those men as individuals, and now that these men are transformed, they carry the message of peace wing by wing across the supermax jail of Texas. We have proper functioning with elders and members churches in different wings of the supermax jail in texas so much so that a newspaper has reported there is peace breaking out in this jail 
There is peace breaking out. Violent crime is plummeting. And these men who have come to preach the gospel of peace in jail are ministering to gang wars between Hispanic and African-American men. And they go in knowing that even if they stabbed and die, they can lay down their life because they depart to go to glory with the Lord. They fear nothing. Their feet are blessed as cell by cell. They walk in and declare peace is possible for all people who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And people are responded so much so they are now working with other prisoners to send them as missionaries into other prisons across Texas and plant more churches in the prison systems of Texas. And they are starting to see crime in Texas affected as these prisoners graduate from jail out back into the community, bringing with them the news of peace in the name of Jesus Christ. My favourite is one man, he, he goes and he preaches to those on death row or in, or in um, isolation, what is that, solitary confinement, and they get a little food slot. So they open up their food slot and he's in there doing CrossFit in front of each window and he's just declaring and preaching the gospel while doing crossfit before them all and trying to just so keen is he to see the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to everybody in the jail. Could be a mystery for you, Serge. (laughs) Do you have that conviction that peace is possible through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, that his death on the cross has satisfied every record of wrong? That there is no cause for division amongst the people, there is nothing that we cannot forgive one another and embody the gospel of peace to the world? Ephesians 3.10 tells that the manifold wisdom of God is revealed through his church and in context that means those who should hate each other but are united around the worship of Jesus Christ are the revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. That's what you are. You are people who by rights in any other walk of life should be at war with each other. But in the gospel of Jesus Christ are truly family a visible embodiment of his kingdom, his reign, his glory. Is Christ enough for you? Romans 1, 16 to 7, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. The gospel is the power of salvation. We know that. But have you considered what it says in verse 17, that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So if we live a gospel, if we are a community of men and women who are not perfectly reconciled or reconciling through the cross of Jesus Christ, we are lying about the righteousness of God. If families do not reconcile on account of Jesus Christ, their testimony is to lie about the righteousness of God. If if different nationalities do not reconcile on account of the work of Jesus Christ, they do nothing less than lie about the very righteousness of God. But if we do, if we love the unlovely, if we keep no record of wrongs, if we forgive 77 times 7 times, is not Christ proclaimed here in this church as greater than everything that would divide? Brothers and sisters, it is no small thing 
that Jesus Christ has laid upon you, the preaching of peace through your unity to this area of Adelaide. That is no small thing. And I don't know what you work you do, but I tell you this, you have no greater work than that. You have no greater responsibility in your life than to live at peace with God and fellow through the work of Christ in your life. And anything that would distract from that needs to be cast aside. Jesus came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. What does that mean for us? Well, Paul is doing something very interesting here under the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit to reapply the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 57, 19. In Isaiah, the passage says, peace, peace to the one who is far or near and I will heal him. Now, the context of those who are far or near in Isaiah's book is that Israel has been exiled and God is promising peace to the Jewish people gathered in Babylon, that is, the near. He's saying that peace has been promised from God to those in Babylon, the Jewish people in Babylon, and that peace has also been promised in the book of Isaiah to those who have been scattered in the exile far and wide amongst the other nations of the Mediterranean. But what Paul does here which the New Testament does time and time again, is to take the promise applied strictly to Israel and extend the borders to include all people across the globe. The near and the far are no longer just those who are Israel. The preaching of peace, brothers and sisters, are now to those who are near and close to God but not in God and those who are far from God. The preaching of the gospel is required by you for all people, those who have appeared to have good moral lives, who grew up in youth group and played Bible trivia nights and never drink and always wear a collar to church, but are inside or are in turmoil and wrecked and pulled this way and that by sin. You need to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Because they need it. They need to know that a religious life is no life of peace. It's only through faith in the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf that anyone has peace. Anyone. You may have grown up memorising the Ten Commandments and learnt that King David is all about you slaying the Goliaths in your life all the while just wearing that beautiful mask to hide the muck and the mire. You need the gospel preached to you. And we preach the gospel to those who are far, to those whose lives are an absolute train wreck. I've done prison ministry and, I, and I, I shared the gospel the very last time I was in there and a man responded and as I walked out, the prison guard told me what he was in jail for and what his conduct was like inside and if I could have, I would have kicked the door back down, stormed into that cell and ripped the gospel off him. I was so outraged at what he had done. But that's our calling, is it not? To preach the gospel to all people. Because the scandal is God's grace is sufficient for you, for me, and for everybody who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ. It's scandalous, but it is powerful. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is sufficient for the peace of all people with God and the peace of all people with one another. For those who appear morally upright but live a life of quiet turmoil and for those whose worst moral failings are before our eyes all have exact same access to peace with God the Father through Jesus Christ we keep no record of wrongs against one another we see in the New Testament the grace the outrageous grace of God to the worst of people leprosy was often representative of sin of the state of being unclean 
If you had leprosy, i.e. sin, you were shunned from the community, isolated and without hope. Mark 1, 40 to 42 records this. Then a man with leprosy came to him, Jesus, and on his knees begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Brothers and sisters, the gospel that Jesus Christ is preaching to the world through you, through the Slavic Church of Queenstown, makes people clean. It's making you clean. And what does Paul, what does Peter hear from the Lord in the vision in Acts 11? We don't get to call unclean what the Lord has called clean. You don't get to look left and right tonight and call anybody unclean in this building because the blood of Christ has washed them clean. And for those in the streets outside, without hope and far from the Lord, tell them about Jesus Christ. Call them into a life of peace with God in a community in perfect peace with itself against all odds. Explainable only by the ministry of Jesus Christ in your midst. That's what you are. A city on a hill. A light whose light cannot be dimmed. Because you are the revelation of the peace of God to a world gripped in war. Brothers and sisters, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't think people here are ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to say this. Don't lie about the righteousness of God. Don't hold on to petty feuds or conflicts occurring somewhere else and in the process lie about the work of Christ on the cross for you. We do not get to call unclean what the Lord has called clean. We are a one people. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile. We are all peace, at peace with God, at peace with one another in Christ Jesus. To the praise of the Father and the joy of his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you have seen us in our divisions, in our wars, in our anger, in our, our eternal restlessness. And Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to wipe away those records of sins that haunt us, that divide us, that give us identities permanently at loggerheads with one another. Father, through the ministry of your spirit this evening, would your churches across Adelaide that believe the gospel of Jesus Christ be as one, united, one people under one Lord living in one kingdom, perfectly reconciled through Christ to the Lord and perfectly reconciled to Christ with one another. Lord, help us represent your gospel in these streets. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Remain standing. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 23 and 24. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Amen? Amen. You're dismissed. Enjoy one another's company at Chashka Chai. Don't forget what you heard this evening. God bless.